All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and my guest today is Pastor Brian Croft. Uh, he's a longtime seasoned pastor, runs a ministry, practical shepherding, and uh, author, speaker, all over the place. Uh, friend for a while. I've known you for, I don't know, a few years now. Uh, Brian, welcome to the show, and why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me, Richard. Uh, yeah, so I've been a pastor for, for 25 years. I uh, did eight and a half uh, years of associate pastor work, some different churches, primarily doing uh, music ministry and youth ministry uh, around that. And then I went to be the senior pastor of Auburndale Baptist Church, and I was the senior pastor there for 17 years and just transitioned about a year ago out of that to serve practical shepherding full time. Uh, so practical shepherding started out of my my ministry in that church, uh, which I can share a little bit about uh, later. But the uh, the ministry came out of that, just training guys how to do practical ministry. I'm um, living in Louisville, Kentucky, pastoring and Southern seminaries in the shadow of, of our church. And so a lot of guys were getting good theological training, but seminaries don't teach you how to be a pastor. And I realized that guys who were feeling a call to be a pastor, I was pouring into guys doing that. And it just kind of it kind of just came out of that ministry to those to those younger guys. So um, 25 years as a, as a pastor and now serving full time here. Also lead the church revitalization center at Southern Seminary. So I do that on a, a part time basis also, which is also something that that came out of my ministry as a, at, at Auburndale, which was which was a classic kind of church revitalization situation in Southern Baptist life. So uh, you can talk about any of those things that you want to. I'm married to Kara, married 25 years as of two weeks ago. Nice. And um, I have four kids, two are uh, Samuel, my son is 22. And then I have three daughters, uh, Abby's 20, Isabel is 17, and Claire is is 14, going to be 15 here in a week or so. So I have four kids, two, two grown and out of the house, two in high school still. Nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, why don't you talk just a little bit about, I mean, that's kind of, I know I sent you some questions, but, uh, your first, why do you feel called? Why did you feel called to be a pastor? I know even for me, when I went to seminary, I wasn't really sure. And then you kind of hone that a lot of guys I met either further honed it and realized, yes, absolutely. Or, uh, I just want to keep doing school or they just say, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. And there's sometimes a real mystical depending on whether you're a Southern Baptist or you're just evangelical or you're this, or you're more seekery or, I don't, you know, different denominations, different stripes. Some are very like, you know, you kind of got to, well, do you feel the, the umph, the unction, the, this, the, that to be called sometimes it's just, ah, I want to be a pastor and I like telling jokes. So of course, you know, and there's a, a mix of, of everything in between. Why did you feel called or how did you feel called to know that you were, wanted to be a pastor? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a lot there. Um, I went to, so I became a, a Christian when I was 13 years old. I grew up in a church that was a very unhealthy church, did preach the gospel. Uh, I heard the gospel at 13 years old at a youth lock-in at my church, but some college students were brought in to do this lock-in. I heard the gospel at 13 and the Lord saved me. And, and But I, I grew up in an unhealthy church and I didn't have good discipleship. So, you know, really kind of floundered in, in my Christian life through my, my teen years, just trying to figure things out. In a lot of different ways, went to college, went to Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, pursuing pursuing music there. And while I was there, you know, kind of had a crisis of faith, you know, just leaving your home and and all those things that come with growing up. And when I was at college there, uh, I was down there to pursue music and realized it's not really what I wanted to get into. I mean, uh, it's, it's a whole separate story, just kind of 18 and naive and I uh, got a got a rude awakening to the music business industry and those kinds of things. But while I was there, I felt some kind of call in, into the ministry. I have no idea what, what that was. Uh, I didn't know my Bible. Well, I had no categories for this. I had nobody mentoring me. It was just kind of this. Yeah. But I, I love Jesus and I love people. Maybe, you know, maybe this is kind of what I'm feeling called to. Well, I had a friend who was a youth pastor at a large church back home and I connected with him and he reached out to me and said, you know, why don't you come and serve with me and we'll sort, I'll help you kind of sort through this. So at 20 years old, I came home, last place I wanted to go, but I moved home and went on staff at a church and was on staff at this large church in a youth ministry that was pragmatic, entertainment driven, you know, wasn't healthy, but it was a place to serve. It was a place to get my feet wet. And I was 20 years old. And from the day I had transitioned from Auburndale last year, 
I was on staff at a church every day of my life for 27, 27 years, 26 years. And so I, I, I learned I kind of plane was being built as, a, as, as I flew it. I didn't have good mentors. And so I was still left kind of figuring this out as I was serving in ministry in many unhealthy contexts. So the Lord really protected me. I had no business being in ministry in those early years as I look back on it. And the Lord was kind just for me to not make a mess of it. But I, I really was going by a lot of it was just a subjective call that you were kind of referring to. Felt this call. I had nobody to help me sort through it. Had no biblical categories for it. My early 20s, I got exposed. I, I got exposed to um, uh, three things happen. I got exposed to uh, the Bible in a really real and, and powerful way. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife actually was a student of the Word, helped me learn how to study the Bible, and the Lord. It was just kind of an awakening, and so I started devouring my Bible, started reading theology, and learning about some of those things. I didn't go to seminary, so I was learning about those things. And I finally found some pastoral mentors outside the churches I was serving in that started teaching me about ministry, teaching me what a pastor is, teaching me about what a local church is supposed to be. Mm. And those were formative. So I'm in my early 20s. I'm newly married. And God used that to, to shape me in a really significant way. And it totally changed the trajectory of, of where I was going. So it started for me. It was a subjective call. Mm. I just felt this call to go. I, it's kind of hard to articulate and then later, the, I started getting these biblical categories for calling, you know, internal call, the desire, external call that so, a, a local church or people yeah. outside of you who can affirm your gifts, affirm your calling, those kind of things. Those things started to, to shape me in a, in a lot of different ways. So by the time I went to Auburndale as the senior pastor, I'm barely 29 years old, but I had a really good foundation from mentors uh, outside the churches I was serving in. Um, that really shaped that. The other thing that God used this is a painful way to learn. I learned a lot of hard mistakes, but they were real formative when I learned them because they were painful as I learned them. I served in churches of, and I went to, I went served in four different churches as, as an associate pastor. Went to every senior pastor and said, hey, will you mentor me? Will you teach me? I know I don't know what I need to know. And all four of them said no. They didn't have, they had different reasons. It was, they didn't have time for it or they didn't think it was their role or, I know wow. it's crazy, Richard. So, but that's, that's just, so I, I'm learning ministry in busy, you know, pragmatic situations. And I'm having to learn a lot of hard lessons the hard way. Yeah. But when I learned them, they shaped me. Like I, I really learned them. And so when I, and then I got mentoring outside those churches. So when I went to be the senior pastor at Auburndale, I really had learned the hard way, kind of hard knocks on how mm -hmm. to do pastoral ministry. And then I had mentors teaching me that, yeah, that's what it really is about. So uh, when I went to Auburndale, I understood how to care for people in the hospital and visit widows, and do funerals and, and you know, how I wanted to approach a preaching ministry and prayer ministry and, and all those kinds of things. So when I went there, I felt like I knew what I needed to do to shape young guys who were coming to me, asking me to train them. That's good. Wow. Uh, those types of stories are always funny when you you... Oh yeah, I asked my pastor for this or that, and you think it's like, well, it's a no-brainer, and they say no or or something, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> well, well, Richard, I'll say that. I mean, I look back on it; I had no answers back then, obviously, but I see the kind providence of God. Like He lit a fire in me mm. when I went to be the pastor of this church. Kind of, I remember making a vow to the Lord. Like, look, I'm I'm 29. I have no seminary. I've never been a lead pastor before, and I go to this dead dying church with 30 elderly people about ready to close. Mm. And I'm like, God, if you send anybody here that feels a call in the ministry, I will do all I can to train them and teach them so they don't have to learn like I learned. Yeah. And God used that. He just lit a fire in me to want to train and raise up guys. Amen. That's good. No, that's that's and that's encouraging overall. And I think a lot of times, especially. And I don't know if it's, you know, my generation or just we're always like this or we're more young like this when we're younger. but there's always a lack of patience. And that's something that I, when we met a number of years ago and when you shared your story and we, you know, whatever class it was, I was interviewing you for, um, that there really was a level of commitment and patience that you exhibited and still do. Uh, but especially early on, like you said, with a very small church, pretty much ready to close its doors and you stuck with it for a number of years. And I think it's, from my perspective, it's limited, but very, very profitable. It's, it's, it's awesome. 
Um, if you want, I mean, you don't have to share. I know between you and me and anybody else, um, <laughs> but you had some challenges early on. Uh, and I remember one of the classes in seminary I had, it was kind of like you have a challenge usually as a pastor of the first year. And then there's one usually at year three and then maybe year seven. Um, care to talk about some of those or just kind of how you handled those and, and the ins and outs of, of all the situation? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. In fact, I do quite often. Now it's a big part of what I do ministry wise because it it lets pastors know when they're going through the same thing. They're they're not alone. Uh, that the isolation the pastors feel is real. It's one of the things our ministry does is try to help them not feel that way. So the summary of my story is that uh, I went to Auburndale Baptist Church and it uh, it had been in decline for about 30 years. It was down to 30 elderly folks. Uh, financial shambles. This old, beautiful, historic church is falling down around them. They don't have the means to take care of it. And it was probably two to three years from closing based on the trajectory it was on. Felt called to go there. You know, I'm an optimist. I'm a, I'm a dreamer. I'm positive. And, and I'm like, and we had been warned about this church. Church had a tradition, had a, had a reputation of chewing up its pastors and spitting them out. They hadn't had a pastor stay longer than four years for the last, since 1972. So wow. um, they had a quite a reputation. I'm going, oh no, this is the Lord's going to work. It's going to be great. My wife was like, no, this is going to be a dumpster fire. You, you just wait. <laughs> and she was so right. You know, she was right. Uh, and I went in and it was, we knew it'd be a rough place, but we didn't realize how rough. So three different movements to get me fired in the first five years of the church. The first one was at three months. The second, which was uh, I inherited a music leader who had, uh, who tried to get me, who tried to start a movement to get me fired three months in. So whatever that honeymoon is, Richard, I, I'm that one year honeymoon period. Everybody talks about, I'd never experienced that. You'll wow. have to talk to somebody else about what that's like. Um, <laughs> I stayed out of trouble for about 18 months after that because the church numerically grew. Somehow the Lord started sending some people and the church started seeing growth for the first time in decades. So, you know, as a Southern Baptist, if your church numerically grows, even if people hate you, they will leave you alone because they ultimately want to see the church grow and not die. So yeah. uh, the second firing attempt happened at two and a half years. My deacons uh, did not like some things happening and they they tried to get me fired while I was on vacation. So that's year two and a half. And the only reason they didn't succeed as my associate pastor who had come with me uh, shut it down while I was gone. Otherwise, I think they probably could have pulled it off. Wow. So um, the third firing attempt was year five, which almost blew the church up. Uh, it was over authority. It was over a leadership change, structure change we were pushing. This is five years in, remember, Richard. So I had been patient in my, you know, the way I felt. And but it was it was an issue of authority. What had happened over five years is slowly some folks had died in the church. Mm -hmm. By the way, some after me, some very supportive of me. I, I'm careful to say this is not an old young thing. Like there was about there was a three to four families that kind of were a regime that held a stranglehold on the church. But there are some longtime older members that were always for me and always with me and were huge support mm -hmm. for me. But what happened is some some people died, older members, and over five years, just slow and steady growth with with primarily younger folks, but people supportive of what I wanted to see happen in the church and the way I was trying to lead. And at year five, he had a collision course in a, in a Southern Baptist congregational church where the authority lies with the members, the majority of the members. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of was just, it just, they declared war when that cross happened. Wow. So in year five, it all blew up and it was, it was messy. Um, in the, there were different points this five years of threats of violence against me. I mean, it was just, a, it was a, it was a zoo. Uh, and in year five, um, the after all that, after surviving that third firing attempt, 30% of the congregation left. The church ran out of money. And uh, at the ripe age of 34 years old, I started having health issues. Uh, I had a heart issue that developed that I still had to monitor this day. Over the, the docs diagnosed it over or just eventually over the stress and anxiety I'd felt over those those five years. And in year six, the ship just turned and, and the church flourished for the next decade after that. And so, um, you know, I look back and see it was part of the Lord's plan that all that. It wasn't just that he made the best of it. Like I look, I'm, I'm convinced those five years were ordained by God for mm -hmm. me because, man, so much of what I do now with practical shepherding and the reason practical shepherding has exploded so much is, is there's not a pastor that doesn't contact us. I don't know what they're going through. Yeah. Or I can I don't have a story to go. Yeah, I know what you, I know what you're saying. I know what you're talking about. You know, 
uh, your name was slandered through the community. Oh, yeah, I get it. So uh, I, as I sit here and, and leading practical shepherding full time, it's, you know, just see the kind providence of God and his plan for me, which I had no idea was his plan for me. Um, but that's the story of the church. And it, and it opened up so much ministry uh, with all these churches that are dying and all these pastors who are struggling. Wow, that's good. Just to, we don't have to dig too deep if you don't want, but again, as a young pastor myself, uh, I mean, I'm not that young, but a lot of other guys might be watching this, you know, at some point. What was it <laughs> at the three month mark that, I mean, I know a lot of guys, you know, we got to be elder rule. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to have this structure and multiple this. And, you know, we get rid of that and change this. And we all do that pretty quick. And, a lot of times guys will get fired, you know, in the first year or two, they'll have a lot of problems, but three months by golly. I mean, what were you doing, Brian? What right. were you doing? <laughs> well, I was taught well by my mentor. You, you preach the word, love the people and don't go in, you know, work with the leaders you have and don't change a bunch of stuff. That's what I was taught. So the yeah. funny thing is I wasn't going in and shaking things up. I was just going in and doing that. That was my plan. But the, the music leader I inherited wanted to be the pastor and they didn't make him the pastor. Uh, so he, from the beginning, he, I think, resented me over that. And he was a, he was a quirky dude. And we, you know, we try, I was just following the playbook. I was taught, I was trying to win him and trying to bring him on. We thought we were. So it's a funny story with him. So uh, people are starting to come to the church and I look and there's, I look up after the service and he's going out and meeting the visitors and talking with them. It's like, man, that's great. We're, <clears throat> we're winning this guy, you know, and he's with us. And, thought things were going well and all of a sudden this happened for several weeks and one of the visitors came up to me ap after the service and said look pastor i just thought you'd want to know your music leader you know came up to me afterwards and said this new pastor he is crazy he is bad news he's going to destroy this church my encouragement to you would be to leave and never come back and so richard i i joke when i'd share this story publicly i was like look i you know i am not a church growth expert <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a bad way to grow a church, you know? <laughs> wow. And so as much as I was taught, don't, you know, don't take on, don't shake anything up. We obviously had to deal with this. So we go to sit and talk with him and say, and confront him about this. And of course that didn't go well. And he blew up and, you know, he, he basically declared war on me at that moment and tried wow. to fire. Him. Of course, you know, he wasn't able to do it, but it got, I mean, it got really ugly. I mean, it got scary at times um, around stuff. And, it's a longer story, but the basically God gave me some leverage with this guy that allowed me to basically force him to resign and do it quiet, quietly. Wow. And he ended up because of the leverage that I had been given uh, against him, uh, he was pretty much forced to do it. And he left quietly. And what's wild is uh, right before this happened, there was another young single guy who had come to the church uh, from the seminary, just showed up. He uh, he heard about what we were trying to do, just wanted to come help. Let me back up, by the way, this this music guy. Uh, he was tone deaf. Mm. So I inherited a music guy who's tone deaf. Now, <laughs> Richard, no judgment. If if you're tone deaf, it's okay. There's plenty of people who are. Those who don't know what that means, it means you can't hear pitch in a song. Yeah. So, um, which again, it's okay. You probably should not be leading the singing in the church if you're tone deaf. Just saying, wow. you know. Wow. So uh, that's what I inherited. Anyway, so I'm, I'm dealing with that stuff too. With this this other single guy that shows up, he just says, Hey, I'm here to help. I reckon really musically gifted, it's theologically sound, sweet guy, humble guy. And when this guy, we, when we were, when I was able to force this guy to, uh, to peacefully leave, this guy was there and he stepped right into his role. We actually put him in, in his, in his place. And, and he actually had the same first and last name of the previous. <laughs> wow. So it's like, I'm three months in and I'm like, man, this is weird. This is like interesting. You know, it feels like, feels like something's happening here. So, wow. um, but so that was, that was three months in, you know? And so it, I wasn't doing like, I, matter of fact, I was, I've had two phone calls today already, Rich, of guys who are trying to change things way too fast and they're getting trouble. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm glad when they finally asked. So am I missing something? Am I just moving too fast on this? And I just say, since you're asking me, uh, yes, you're moving too fast. You're going to get yourself in trouble and probably fired if you try to do this in the first 12 months of your pastorate kind of thing. So, yeah. So I wasn't trying to shake up anything. I just I was just. Do, but that and that's the other thing about this kind of work is 
go in and preach, love people, but you may be forced to have to deal with something that you don't want to deal with too soon. But you've got, you know, one of the things I teach guys is you, you've got to allow, if you really, we really believe the word of God through the spirit of God is what will breathe life into a dead church. You've got to give it time. So I, I often say that just because God's word is powerful doesn't mean it acts quickly. Mm. You know, Mark chapter four, Jesus tells us exactly how his word works. And, and the, the parable of the sower is a brilliant illustration that Jesus gives to help us understand how the word works. The seed sown, but you got to wait and give it time to find good soil and find root and grow and grow. And then it bears fruit at the end. So uh, that's what I was told to go in to do. And despite not wanting to shake things up, that's what happened three months in. Wow. No, that's good. I appreciate it. That's, I'm sure many people <laughs> have had similar thoughts or are just shocked because, I mean, it's it's amazing the amount of things that you hear that churches will do or say. I mean, it's just, again, anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. But um, so when did, so you kind of give some of the reasons why you started Practical Shepherding. When did that really start to... I guess, for lack of a better word, take off. When were you, how long have you been doing practical shepherding in like the organized? Because I know you have all sorts of seminars and obviously you have your contact for a lot of guys. You'll do conferences. Um, you've written a, a load of books and a lot of different revitalization and pastoral books and pastor family books and everything else. Really, really helpful. Uh, a lot of them I've read. They're, they're great, great resources. How long have you been doing practical shepherding in particular? A yeah, good question. I didn't set out to lead to start practical shepherding. Like I'm a local church pastor. It's kind of like this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life, you know. And yeah. I, I'm I'm a pa- I'm a pastor at heart. Love the local church and uh, love shepherding people. So I was just doing that. And as I mentioned before, you know, some young guys showed up in the early years. Honestly, what practical shepherding started was when I started training these young guys for ministry in our church, which we didn't know at the time, but with everything just kind of uh, the turmoil in the church was really wonderful, pl- was a wonderful place to train guys about ministry. So these young guys are like, I want to learn how to be a pastor. Like, oh, you want to learn how what, what it's like to be a pastor, huh? Come on. <laughs> you know, I'll take you to this house where I'm going to get like yelled at. I know when I go to visit these people, <laughs> you can experience that. And, you know, they were at the, they were at the, the, the members meetings that would blow up and people would be shouting at me and everything's like, Wow. You sure you want to be a pastor? So like those early years were so formative for those guys to really learn what ministry could be like. Hopefully it's not like that all the time. But um, so it started early in in training these guys, just taking them with me to do ministry, which is the way I think it's best way to learn ministry as a pastor to what it means to be a pastor. And so that's really where it started, because eventually some of these guys, uh, we started an internship, uh, you know, not paid, just kind of a couple of guys every four months taking them through a crash course in pastoral ministry. And I'm making them do a lot of the ministry with me. And after going to a hospital once, a few of these guys said, hey, will you write some of this stuff down for us that you're teaching us? Um, I'm not a writer, wasn't a writer. This is not a false humility. I really was a terrible writer. Um, and so I, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not a writer, but I'll write some notes down for you kind of thing. It eventually turned into a little book called Visit the Sick. It was on just caring for people in the hospital and caring for the sick and the dying. And I had tons of people help me write it because I just was did not write. And so, but that book actually got published. You're talking, so Richard, you're talking 12 years ago now when that book got published. So, you know, this is back in the day where the internet was drastically changing the way book publishing uh, happened. And so a nobody author published, a, a nobody publisher, small publisher in the UK is the one that took this on because they're one of the few places that actually did pastor, uh, practical ministry stuff. This little book, they published it, and the thing took off on the internet. A couple of big bloggers picked up on it, and wow. and and it got a wide spread of of, of just internet, you know, um, uh, use and stuff. And what happened is a lot of pastors saw it, yeah. and it got a lot of traction because. Still not much, but certainly back then, there's hardly anything book wise, resource wise on practical ministry stuff. Uh, there's still not a ton on it. We've written a lot of stuff now but on it. But um, that book, what it did is expa- expose this gaping hole mm. of practical resources that didn't exist. So um, after that book 
seemed to get a lot of traction, did much better than, than any of us ever thought it would. It opened opportunities to write more, which I almost didn't do. But I got some counsel from people saying, no, you need to you need to keep writing this stuff. So I started I wrote a couple other books that had the same uh, effect on it, kept training guys. And and so the Internet and then we started a blog and we called it Practical Shepherding. And I would put like a two, three hundred word thing up. By the way, blogs, I had to learn what a blog was, Rich. I didn't know what a blog was at the time, which terrified me. The thought of <laughs> writing something and publishing it immediately and somebody could read it. Yeah, uh, just terrified me. So I'm learning to write as I'm writing books and I, as I'm starting a blog, I'm not the way to do it, but that's just kind <laughs> of how it worked for me. Yeah. And so the, the ministry was start. it basically became the first couple of books in that blog. Well then all because of the internet, all of a sudden we started getting pastors calling us asking for help, mm. you know, and, and what ended up starting to evolve, it went from being just this lane of practical ministry, which we still do. But guys are like writing us like, hey, I got this situation trying to care for this person who's sick and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, by the way, I have this issue with one of my deacons and I don't have anybody to talk to. Can I maybe talk to you about that, too? And so yeah. this other lane opened up. So practice training then became these, these two lanes, really, of ministry, practical training and then caring for the souls of pastors. Because, Richard, who cares for the pastors? Like pastors do what they do to care for the souls of church members. Yeah. But who pastors the pastors? There's not many people who do that. And wouldn't we all agree that, that pastors need care just as much as the congregation does? So practical shepherding blew up over uh, that just that that evident need that existed. And so 10 years, within the next 10 years, the ministry just kind of blew up. We got about 25 books in our resources now. And of course, it's an international ministry. And I mean, I, I, I'm full time and we have seven full and part time uh, staff members. And so the ministry just continue to grow. It's why I went full time with it. Well. Wow. That's great. Are you guys, are you still part of Arbondale or are you at a different church now? Great question. So the council I got as the long-term pastor of Arbondale, when I transitioned out, it was best that I left the church. So the other gets to so the new guy's not in my shadow. Yeah. And so everybody I talked to who'd walked through this gave me the same council. I actually planned on staying. Hmm. So when I transitioned, I left and and we went and, and joined another local church. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, have, have, um, you know, stayed in touch with the church and obviously the the, the church, the, the guy who succeeded me eventually, they went through a process, but uh, he was one of my elders. So um, the guy who's the senior pastor now was a guy that I raised up and trained and he served as an elder with me. And now he's the senior pastor. Oh, good. Yeah. I remember seeing that, the ad, I don't know, a year or so ago, year, I guess it was you know, like a year and a half ago. And I thought, wait a second. And then I think I emailed you and you were like, oh yeah, I'm doing full time or something. So <laughs> I was like, what happened? But yeah, I can imagine leading a ministry, especially with a staff of even just a couple, but much less seven and writing books and having all sorts of other conversations with pastors. And like you said, pastoring pastors is a full time job for sure. Well, Richard, I think it's important to point out with, with Auburndale that, you know, the church never grew like large numbers. And I think that's another way God's used my ministry uniquely is that, you know, I'm. I'm writing books, I'm traveling and speaking, I'm doing these things. But most of the guys who do that pastor a church of a thousand or yep. more, you know, and I think what's unique about our church is all that happened and all the guys we raised up, all the people we raised up, men and women, to serve in ministry in different ways. Uh, our church never got above 100 members mm. in my 17 years. And, you know, and, and especially in a denomination, in the Southern Baptist denomination, which puts so much focus on numbers, you know, God has used this as in a good, really good way to kind of equalize it. Wait a minute. How do we evaluate ministry? So our church never had a lot of money. Our church never had a lot of people. But in my 17 years, we raised up, trained and raised up and sent out 32 families in either to the mission field or into pastoral ministry somewhere. And, you know, that that's a I mean, that's the that's a big legacy of the of the church. But, you know, I, I give that number. I'm not a numbers guy, but I give that number because, you know, that's a that's a lot of people in a church of 100 hundred members at the most. And when I left the church, it was 75 members, wow. but that 75 members had diversity within it. That 75 members had five generations present. So what God is allowing me to do with the ministry that I, that I do, especially when I go and publicly speak and, and write and just do interviews like this, you know, I'm trying to create a different paradigm to evaluate God at work in a church. It's not about numbers. It's not about money. It's actually about, you know, is the church multi-generational? You know, yeah. is the church, what kind of diversity, you know, is there rich and poor, you know, is there black and white, is there, you know, whatever it is. 
And so I'm trying to put a new paradigm out there that I actually quite, I think is, is more aligned with the New Testament and how God evaluates the health of the church, yeah. not necessarily by numbers and money. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I and mean, that's, that's one thing that I've, I've had a, a struggle with and I've, it's not secret or anything. And I shared it briefly before we went on is just the uh, level of those who are there investing in them. And that's something that I've shared with other guys and pastors and whatnot and guys that may come up or go to seminary and feel like they want to do this. And I mean, who doesn't want a pastor of 500 people or 5,000 people, right? Like I'm look at how successful I am, especially in the SBC, you know, where it's all nickels and noses as the old phrase goes. And, you know, I think if, if the whole last, you know, 18 months to two years has shown us anything, a lot of people who don't go to church anymore, they, they were just going to begin with, they weren't really helpful probably anyway, they might not even be saved. They might, they might be living in sin. They might be doing all sorts of stuff. And I think the Lord used it to sift a lot of people and at least shake people to realize either I I don't need this. And quite frankly, you know, especially you, especially more than me even, but do we really want those people that are causing problems and having contention and complaining about the carpet and the pastor's tie or no tie or sport coat, no coat, pulpit, big pulpit, small pulpit, you know, and just these, these junk things that, they're not, they don't belong in the body of Christ anyway. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that. Do we, you know, we love people, right? We want to hang out. We want you to hear the gospel. We want you to be sharpened and encouraged. We want you to serve. We want you to give. We want you to go. But if a lot of these folks, you know, you hear those stories about trying to get the pastor fired or trying to complain about this or split the church or whatever, I feel like that's probably a better thing that these people who are using lockdowns and whatnot to not come to church, it's like, well, probably better that you don't, <laughs> you know? And, and I think, again, the Lord has, has sifted out a lot of people that, you know, either are in sin or just not believers at all. And they realize they can live without church. And so they're going to, and I think well, it'll strengthen those who are there. Well, Richard, I think there's a part of my story I need to add too, as you say that is that, you know, I think what is one of the things that's underestimated in a pastor's ministry is time and being patient to, to give God time to do what he's going to do. Because, you know, it's important that I share this part of my story that those are, I went through all the early years. Most of the people who were trying to get me fired in those first five years, most of them ended up staying at the church. Oh, and wow. God ended up redeeming our relationships to where when I left 17 years uh, into this, uh, a lot of the people who, some of the most meaningful relationships I had in the church were people who were trying to get me fired in the first five years. So, so God did a redeeming work. And I think I say that because I think, you know, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, are they sheeps? Are are they sheep? Are they wolves? Uh, Are they just wounded? You know, I I say this often that oftentimes in the congregation, a wolf and a wounded sheep look very similar Mm. and they, they act very similar. And it, it takes a loving pastor over years, not months, but years to sift through what they really are. And one of the one of the great redemptive parts of my story is that so many of those people who are after me, we ended up learning to love each other and come to understand each other. And it wasn't just we just got along. I mean, I I had some of the most meaningful relationships I had in the church uh, when I left were those people. And wow. that, that's why they were so meaningful when God redeemed what we had. I mean, that's why they were so special. No, that's good. I appreciate you sharing that. Wow. Um the um that's good what would you suggest i know you said because you didn't go to seminary at all right you just went to college and that was it right right what would you i know um not a lot of guys are able to go to seminary right or they're they don't live where there's a good one or this one used to be good and now it's not or they don't have the money or they've got married young and had kids young and you know it's too hard and working and they want the wife at home and you can't financially and everything else <clears throat> what do you suggest to to men uh, in particular who just can't do it but want to pastor? They want to at least, you know, maybe work for a ministry. They want to do, quote unquote, more um, books to read, things to do, you know, just throw, throw out your suggestions and thoughts. I mean, a lot of it's your own experience, but what do you think? Yeah, well, I, I'll first say that. I- I do believe I know I'm an anomaly in some ways in that um, you know I did I did my undergraduate work at a state school. I did Belmont two years, as I mentioned, then I finished at a state school. 
particular. Um, I, <clears throat> I was not, I was an opposed to seminary. I just same same idea you mentioned that just young growing family uh, having to make things work those kind of things. But I but I had good mentors that fed me tons of books uh, that that I really got a seminary education through you know a decade of them feeding me all kinds of those those books. Um, in fact, I had one mentor that pretty much everything he gave me, I devoured uh, book wise. Yeah. And he pretty much fed me an MDiv program. I didn't know that's what he was doing, but he knew that's what he was doing. Yeah. Well, and as he's giving me stuff to read. So I say that because, you know, seminary is one way, uh, uh, one of several ways, I think, for a pastor to get the training that he needs. Uh, and that is that a pastor needs to know his Bible well. A pastor needs to have theological structure and categories to work from. You know, I think a, a pastor needs to, you know, to some degree needs to understand the languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually, you know, so I don't have any seminary under my belt, but, you know, I audited a class here or I learned from a friend here. Uh, I had a friend teach me Greek for five years mm -hmm. because my, my, one of my mentors said, you need to learn at least Greek. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, just, it was important to, to do that. So I did. But I just learned it in a different kind of way. Seminary is the way most guys get that kind of training. But as I mentioned earlier, seminary does not teach you how to be a pastor. Yeah. So everybody needs to learn how to be a pastor, it needs to learn what pastoral ministry is and how to do that kind of ministry. So, you know, I so I always say whether it's seminary or whether it's just ferocious reading, like, which is what you're you're asking me to, you know, to mention, which I will. I just wanted to give that preface that I do believe that pastors need theological training and practical pastoral ministry training in some way. And and one a lot of times one's getting more a guy who just just dismisses seminary and learns practical ministry really well. That's great. But he's still got to get he's still got to learn the theology. He's still got to learn his Bible somehow. Yeah. Uh, and those kind of things. And but what I'm seeing, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, you know, and you were at Southern. I mean, you. What is common at a really high end, you know, highly functional seminary like that is guys get massive theological degrees and they have no idea how to be a pastor. I, I see it all the time. Me too. And, <laughs> uh, so, so I, I want to stress that both needs to take place. Uh, I've got done a lot of ministry in England and Scotland and there's, you know, there's not a ton of seminaries over there. But man, they have it. some of these places have a tremendous setup in learning how to do ministry mentored by a pastor. And these guys end up reading a lot of theology and systematics and church history and even learn languages through the mentoring of those. So that these the cat those two categories are really important. So having said that, I think you know you've got to read about practical pastoral ministry stuff. Uh, that's a lot of the focus of our books. But there's a lot of great books out there from stuff that's, that you know that Spurgeon did to there's. You know, there's pastoral theologies. A lot of times you have to go to read dead guys to read good pastoral theologies. But that is, you know, you, that that helps you teach about learning ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think everybody needs to have read a, a good systematic theology. Just so you have your categories for theology, church history. Uh, I'm a big history guy, so I think I'm biased in that way. But I think it's important for every pastor to know uh, to know just church history in, in, on a basic, you know, on a basic level. Yeah, do something, whatever you got to do to learn, you know, to learn languages. I think you have to to, to know those uh, biblical hermeneutics. So not just know your Bible, but you got to know how to how to study. You got to know how to interpret uh, to, and understand your Bible in that way. So, uh, you know, I learned how to study the Bible through the inductive study method. So I just I learned the Bible through just, you know, observing and marking the text and doing some of the, the inductive study method. I learned my Bible really well. But I mm -hmm. still had to read uh, to to learn concepts and theological categories and hermeneutics and and all those kinds of things. So theology, hermeneutics, languages, history, all the things that if you don't get it in seminary, you need to go in and read it on your own. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think you're a testament to that, both doing it yourself, but then also <clears throat> even being a companion to, you know, not very far from the seminary and helping a lot of guys. I mean. 30 plus percent of sending people out as missionaries or pastors is astounding. I mean, in, in, you know, if you had that in a church of a thousand, that means 300. So let's look at a church of a thousand and our, you know, back to our previous question, are they sending out 300, you know, over the course of five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 
Uh, maybe, maybe not. So I think that's one thing that it's the value and the the potency, I think, is really what matters. It's not just volume. Uh, and same thing, I think, with theological education, you're not just, you know, I mean, I know I knew so many guys that MDiv and then it's like, well, I mean, I'll do the THM, too. And then, you know, they knock, they go up for the PhD or they'll go do something and come back for the PhD, which, again, there's nothing wrong with that. I desire to do more education. I don't know when that's going to happen. Personally, I thought it'd be happening already, but (laughs) it is what it is. But if you're just kind of heaping up degrees, uh, uh, you know, and what what are you doing that for is always kind of my question. Well, and this gets us back to the calling question you asked too, Richard. I mean, you know, this is why if somebody's pursuing a call in the ministry, they need a, they need a pastor in their life who is mentoring them because, you know, I'm with you. I see guys who go get MDivs and THMs and they didn't get involved in a local church enough or the pastor didn't have a, have a vision to know he needed to pour into this guy to help him sort through. Like, because when you go, when you go to the hospital to sit with a dying person, they don't give a rip if you know Greek or not. Right. And that's where most yeah. pastors live. And so there's got to be that's why I say there's got to be both. Both are important. I don't mean to disparage theological education, not at all. But so many guys come out with really rigorous theological education, which is great. They have no idea how to love people and care for people and pastor people. So both have to be taught. And the best way to learn that is in a local church under the mentorship of a pastor. That's what yeah. I tried to do at Auburndale. Naively thought that's what pastors just do. So I just did it. And then I come to find out. Well, most pastors don't do this, actually. So the practical shepherding exploded because all of a sudden we were teaching pastors how to do this who weren't doing it. Yeah. No, that's good. That's very wise words. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, that's that's the gist. Those are my main questions. Do you have anything you want to add or any kind of thing you want to go back up and flesh out a little bit more? I I would just say this, that we, we talked a lot about ministry and stuff, but I think there's Two real, the, the core of practical shepherding is pastor's soul, pastor's ministry, pastor's family. We we believe the holistic care of a pastor is essential for him to have a long and thriving ministry. Uh, 50% of pastors, Richard, don't make it five years. 80% don't make it 10 years. Wow. Those numbers are astounding, and they make a really big statement. And that is two things. Ministry is really hard. And two, guys go into it not equipped to handle it. Yeah. So, so I would just stress uh, that we're talking about this ministry stuff, but there's two other pieces. One is, you know, it's a prerequisite according to first Timothy three, that you care for your family well as a first priority. So you got pastors got to care for his wife and his kids and care for them well and, and pastor them as a priority. And then the other is he's got to care for his own soul. A lot of pastors don't know how to rest. They don't know how to care for their own soul. They don't know how to ask for help. So a ministry like ours teaches guys, Hey, no, let us care for you. Let, you know, seek care from other people. So I would just stress that for somebody who's either a pastor and they're wondering why they feel so burnt out or fatigued all the time. If nobody's pouring into you and caring for you, it's, it's impossible to sustain this long term. So I would just want to stress that to any pastor or any congregation member who's listening to this, like love and care for your pastor. He's human. He's limited. Uh, He needs encouragement. He needs love and care. People in the congregation who have awareness to love and care for their pastor is such a gift. Yeah. No, that's good. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Wise, wise words for sure. So thank you again for coming on and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Good to be with you. All right.